Hello, everyone, and welcome once again to Nose in the Book, a Bible reading commentary with me, your host, Pastor Justin Van Reed. We have some great chapters to, to take a look at here, Genesis chapter 13, and then Nehemiah chapter 2, Matthew chapter 12, and Acts chapter 12. And uh, I want to start here with Genesis and uh, chapter 13. You have this interesting uh, situation where Abraham and Lot, they're both dwelling together, their families are growing, they're getting big. And so Abraham comes to Lot and says, hey, listen, let's split up. Why don't you you pick? Abraham gives Lot the choice. What land do you want? In the sovereignty of God, of course, he's working this out so that Abraham's going to uh, pick the land of Canaan. It's going to be the promised land. But he gives Lot the choice. What does Lot do? He looks around and, he's, and he judges based on basic typical worldly judgments. He looks and says, well, this land is the most beautiful. This fertile valley over here by what's you know today the Dead Sea. And he says, this is where I want to go. This is where we're going to live. And uh, the, the Bible describes it as like the Garden of the Lord, like the Garden of Eden. So this is a beautiful land, a very uh, lush and fertile land that Lot chooses. But there's a problem. Now, first of all, Abraham, meanwhile, is going to get the land of Canaan. And God here in this chapter makes this promise to him. Look, left, right, up, down, right, north, south, east, west. I'm going to give you this land. Of course, this is what we come to know as the promised land. Here it is. God is promising Abraham, your descendants are going to dwell in this land. What makes it the promised land? Because God is the one who promises it. Not because from worldly standards it was the best, but because God says, I'm going to make it the best for you. And of course, when you get to the law of Moses and he describes, what will God do in this land if the people will obey? It will be the most fertile land ever. It will just keep on producing uh, in abundance if the people will be obedient because it will be God who is at work there. Meanwhile, Lot has chosen what looks like the best land, but spiritually is a very dark area. Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities are in this area that Lot chooses. And of course, in a few chapters, we're going to see the problems that arise there and arise with Lot's family because of being there. And so, you know, you got to, again, go back to the fact that, you know, we judge on appearances. God's going to make that point way later here in uh, the book of Samuel. Man judges on outward appearance. God looks at the heart. And, uh, and, and really the question is, do, are we going to judge based on worldly judgments and standards? Or are we going to trust the Lord and what he has? All right, moving on to Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 2. And this is a great chapter. Nehemiah goes to the king and, the, you know, wants to go home to rebuild Jerusalem. And the king grants Nehemiah's request. Now, if you're wondering, what's the difference here between Ezra and Nehemiah? What's really going on here? I'm kind of confused in these books. Uh, Af Babyl the Babylonians come into Jerusalem, and under the judgment of God, because God says so, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, they destroy the walls of the city of Jerusalem, and they destroy the temple of God within Jerusalem. All right. Now, fast forward here to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah here. So, 70 years plus has gone by since that last, uh, since the Babylonians came through and destroyed Jerusalem. And now God is beginning fulfillment of his word to Jeremiah. The people are going to return. Okay, we read about that in Ezra. As the people return, though, the first focus, they, uh, where they focus their attention is on the altar of the Lord, the temple of God. So, Ezra is focused on rebuilding the temple and the worship that takes place there. And Nehemiah is focused on rebuilding the city. So the Babylonians destroyed the city of Jerusalem, the walls of Jerusalem, and they destroyed the temple. Ezra comes, and in and, and Ezra we read about the reconstruction of the temple. Here in Nehemiah, we read about the rebuilding of the walls of the city of Jerusalem. And that's what's going on here in Nehemiah chapter 2. He's going to go home. He's going to survey the walls. But the real, uh, the real point of Ezra and Nehemiah is the sovereignty of God. Why is it that Ezra and Nehemiah, why is it that these folks, Zerubbabel and others as they return, that they have favor with the king? Why is it the king gives these letters that Nehemiah asks for? It's because of the sovereignty of God. It's because when God says something's going to be, it's going to be. And so uh, Ezra pointed this out several times. Nehemiah says in this chapter, the gracious hand of the Lord was on me. Okay, so when God is with you, then you will have success. When God decides something's going to be, it will be. And so we see that here in Nehemiah chapter 2. All right, fast forwarding now to the New Testament, Matthew chapter 12. I want to start just by looking at this opening paragraph here. We don't have time to go through the entire chapter of what's going on in Matthew chapter 12. But in the opening paragraph, we read about this discussion about the Sabbath because the disciples are hungry. And so they're going through some grain fields on the Sabbath, and they began just breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. This was completely a lawful activity, 
Problem, of course, from the Pharisees' perspective is they're doing it on the Sabbath. Now, fascinating response by Jesus here. He says to the Pharisees, haven't you read in the scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He went into the house of God and he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? All right, what Jesus is doing here is, is showing that, the, that, that what God has intended all along is something different than what you might read in a wooden literal, uh, literalistic, I should say, um, uh, application of Scripture that you have to look not just at the letter of the words of Scripture, but what is it in the spirit uh, of God? What is it that God is in the heart of God that he is saying in the Scriptures? And so uh, what God cares about people, when you read the Old Testament law, what you will come to, an easy conclusion as you read through the Old Testament law, if you read those books of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, what you will quickly come to the conclusion of is God obviously loves people, cares about people, cares about life, all right? So you have the situation that Jesus brings up where David and his companions, they're running, they're hungry, they're going to die of starvation. What does God really care about, consecrated bread or the life of David and his men? God cares about life. And so uh, you have to remember that when, when, when reading scripture, what does the, the spirit of God want to say? What is the spirit, the intention of God here and uh, and be careful not to have too wooden or literalistic of an application there of the scriptures. It's clearly, Jesus is saying here, uh, no, 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 the heart of God has not changed. Right, the the spirit of the law has not changed. And of course, Jesus has the perfect interpretation, unlike the Pharisees who uh, who only care, of course, about themselves and are using the law to uh, to that end. All right, flipping over here, last couple minutes, Acts chapter. Uh, 12, and this almost is a comical chapter, I think, because you have this situation where uh, Peter's in prison, He the Spirit of God, the, the angel comes, it frees Peter, Peter from prison, and the people in the house are praying, and Peter comes to the door, the little servant girl goes to the door, uh, it says here, uh, she answers the door, she recognizes Peter's voice and is overjoyed. Instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and said, Peter standing at the door. You almost get this picture of Peter, you know, knocking at the door. And she comes to the door and says, Peter, and then slams the door in his face. But <laughs> the bigger point here I want to make is look at what's going on. The people are gathered in prayer. Just think about your own prayer life. The people are gathered in prayer. Lord, deliver Peter from jail. That's what they're praying. Lord, deliver Peter. Free Peter. Okay. God answers their prayer. Peter is freed from prison. Comes to the house. Knocks on the door. Peter's at the door, the servant girl says. And here's what their response is. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. They've been praying for God to do exactly what God does and they say when they're told that God answered their prayer, just as they were praying, while they were praying, they say, nah, you must be out of your mind. You're crazy. And I wonder, do we have the same perspective in prayer? Do we believe, good question for us to consider, do we believe that God answers prayer? When we bring our request to the Lord, do we believe that God can do the things that we are petitioning him to do? good thing for us to consider. All right. End of uh, Acts chapter 12 here uh, is a lesson in humility. You have uh, Herod Agrippa, and he stands up. He's given this speech, and they say it's the voice of a god and not of a man. And instantly an angel of the Lord struck Herod with a sickness because he accepted the people's worship instead of giving the glory to God. And, uh, and he dies instantly there and is consumed with worms. Yikes. So, uh, do you give the glory to God? Right? Well, maybe even, you know, uh, you know, people, uh, you know, praise you, and maybe you are talented, maybe you do good things, but do you recognize that it is ultimately because of what God has done, who God is, God is at work in you, through you, 
and all the praise, all the glory goes to God. Do you give God the glory? Uh, let's be sure to do that. All right, that's all we have time for today. Uh, we hope you enjoyed these readings and this discussion. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to uh, place them in the comments below. Otherwise, hopefully I'll see you again uh, tomorrow. Again, until that time, keep your eyes on the Lord. Keep your nose in the book. We'll see you again soon. Thanks.